I'm Kuhan Pakmander. Welcome to the second episode of the global, uh, the, the global Just Transition series on the Green New Deal. Today we are going to hear about the Green New Deal in South Korea, which is the only country where the Green New Deal is a part of official government policy. We shall hear from th four experts tonight, today, this morning, Lee Tae-dong of Yonsei University, Ju Jin Kim of Solutions for Our Climate, Hong Jong ho of Seoul National University, and Yu Jung kwan of Green Environment Youth Korea or geek. So I've dropped, I'm going to drop their biographies in the chat and I will, will also drop several other links of interest, including a video of our session on the European Green New Deal and a link to the Global Just Transition website. Our segment in December, December coming up, we'll uh, look at the situation in Russia with Vasily Vasil Yablokov of Greenpeace, Tatiana Lanchina of Goal Number no. 7, and Arashak Mikichan of Fridays for Future. That will take place December 10th at noon 
Eastern Standard Time. And you will be able to find the link in the chat for that as well. But tonight we're gonna to hear about South Korea's Green New Deal. As I said, it's a part of the official government program, which includes targeted investments in green and digital technology, the creation of hundreds of thousands of jobs, and a reduction of the country's sizable carbon footprint. But has the government followed through on all its promises? We shall hear now from our four experts in Korea, on the ground, on the front lines of the climate crisis in Asia tonight. In terms of ground rules, each presenter will talk for 15 minutes or less. I will remind them at 14 minutes with this reminder, okay? If anybody in the audience has questions, we, you may put them in the Q&A and we encourage robust dialogue and comments in the chat. So please chime in. Now, let's begin. Our first speaker, Lee Tae-dong, is a professor of political science, director of the Environment, Energy, and Human Resource Development Center at Yonsei University, where he is an Underwood Distinguished Professor. His areas of research include global and subnational environmental politics and policy and NGOs and civic politics. He is also the CEO of Startup, our local petition. So Mr. Lee, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning and good night there. My name is Tedong Lee. I'm working at um, Yonsei University in Political Science Department. Uh, today's topic for presentation is variety of green stimulus policies, the comparative analysis of green growth and green New Deal in South Korea. The, this the topic, this study is a kind of ongoing thing. And um, the question is that, well, when I hear that the Green New Deal policy from South Korea in 2020, and haven't we seen this? Um, policy before. That means we had pretty similar policy in Lee myung -bak administration, green growth. Okay, what are the similarities and differences and what makes the, this similarities and difference are our question? Because it, it is the uh, ongoing question that I mentioned before. So you can ask me a question and, and uh, um, you know, or advice to enhance the quality of the paper. Okay, so um, there are varieties of uh, green stimulus policy because you know each country has been in in uh, different conditions. In, in the same, even in within the same uh, country like South Korea, so green stimulus fund we uh, define as that refers to a policy package designed to revitalize national economy to address the global climate change crisis and to reduce unemployment and inequality by spending national budget. So basically spending money from the government money, the tax, taxpayers' money to cure two things. First, economic crisis and the climate crisis. So this is the, the concept of green stimulus policy. So there are three questions actually for this research. So what are the core components Con contents and elements of GSPs of two administration and what difference do they exhibit? The second question is a kind of uh, more cold, colder question. What factor are associated with uh, such variation? Uh, we are uh, interviewing people to explain uh, this, uh, answer this question. The third question is that, you know, we should learn lesson from the, the, our experience. What lesson can we draw from the analysis so that they help the successful implementation of GSP in Korea, and probably it can be applied to uh, another uh, places in uh, the world. Because I already had a comparative study between the EU Green Deal and um, US Green New Deal in the, the document or plan level. So I think that they tried to extend my research to compare the Korean case. So uh, the green stimulus policy is a a bit of the theoretical background. There's a the argument we can have a 
whether uh, economic development and environmental purpose can be reconciled or not. So one of my uh, current research tried to look at the decoupling in EU. Uh, some EU con country achieved decoupling the, you know, uh, between the economic growth and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission. That means many assume that if a, a country uh, achieved the uh, economic growth, that means we may have more greenhouse gas emission. That's the coupling. However, we found that uh, some of you European country can achieve decoupling between economic growth and greenhouse gas, which means uh, uh, eco even though the, the uh, country achieved the economic growth, but reduced greenhouse gas emission, those country implement and actively engage in the emission trading systems are, are more likely to achieve deco decoupling. That's one of my research. So the, how we look at the uh, interactions or, or dynamics between the co economic development and environmental force is one of the key idea for the um, green stimulus policy. And also uh, there's a many similar terms such as green economy, green growth, green new deals and e ecological modernization theory and the, how we look at the relations between the you know, e uh, economic development and environmental force. However, uh, when you look at the, uh, the literature, I found that the, um, so some gaps. First gap, we found that the, the what are the component of green stimulus policies? And then uh, empirically, it's hard to find the um, comparison within a state about, because there's not that many cases as uh, Guha mentioned that, you know, officially adopt GSP as a, their national policy. Then uh, we try to uh, develop the um, analytic framework to compare the GSP. First, we try to, to understand the visions. So the categories and question is the, the framework to analyze the policies. First one is the vision. So which kind of policy goal does GSP seek to achieve? And then the other part are uh, policy contents, such as climate change mitigation and adaptation, energy transition, green in infrastructure, infrastructure buildings and green industry, social equity and global cooperation. Each uh, category has, uh, has two questions such as, does GPS set climate mitigation goals, the numeric target and implementation, implementation timeline? So we try to build up this uh, framework to compare basically two GPS in South Korea, and I, we can apply this framework to other GPS in other country. So uh, the green growth policy in 2008 and 2009, uh, the vision of green growth policy in Lee myung administration is a green competitiveness. So they wanted to make uh, the South Korea is the seventh or fifth, it, that's the ranking in the world by 2002 to 2050 each. So the environmental state. So three stages are mitigation of climate change and energy independence and creating new engine for economic growth and improvement in quality of life and enhanced international standing. So there are 10 policy directions and I cannot read you know, everything in this uh, paper. However, it covers most of the, um, the component of it that we uh, proposed before. So, and also we uh, see that the, there's a huge amount of expenditure for each categories. Compared to this, uh, Green New Deal policy, so this is the current one in, from uh, 2020. Uh, the vision is a transition to a local low carbon economy. It, it doesn't have a specific, you know, uh, numeric target, but it's more broad uh, the visions. So transition to the low carbon economy. And there are three focus area and projects. That's the green, green transition of infrastructure, low carbon and decentralization, uh, decentralized energy, innovation in green industry. So uh, this Green New Deal in South Korea Propose a 42.7 trillion from the treasury and 
uh, job creation of uh, 659,000 by uh, green job by 2025. So, uh, so these are brief introduction of two policies. So we try to compare these two GSP in South Korea. Then we found that the, um, you know, the Green New Deal, the current group, Green New Deal didn't talk that much about the specific goal in uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation in, in the first document, but it's, it's in incorporated with the, uh, the carbon neutrality later, but uh, at the beginning, I didn't mention that much of uh, climate change mitigation. The second, the one of most, uh, you know, uh, visible difference between the two GSP, so how we make the uh, energy transition. In green growth in Lee Myung -bak administration emphasize on the uh, nuclear energy as a kind of measure to achieve the energy transition. However, in this current Green New Deal, they didn't mention about the uh, nuclear energy for uh, energy transition. And another interesting thing that I found, they said, you know, uh, GSP in green growth emphasize on global cooperation. However, we do not see that much about the um, global cooperation in Green New Deal. Rather, uh, Green New Deal policy, current Green New Deal policy focus more on uh, you know, having more domestic job creation and domestic investment. So uh, I you, you feel free to ask questions and then provide uh, the comments about my uh, framework and uh, any uh, missing component. And um, then I'm asking questions as of why they they do not have that much of the um, you know, global component in Green New Deal compared to the green growth. And another study of mine tried to look at the, um, you know, why the, the current government, you know, pursued it, the um, you know, post nuclear energy. So that explained a lot for the debt difference per se. But I, my, my, one of uh, my questions is that, why there's a difference between the global uh, cooperation for uh, Green New Deal, the green uh, stimulus policy. So what explained this, uh, you know, uh, differences? So uh, the implication here is that, you know, for the GSP, it, it's not just about the, you know, job creation or economic growth. It, it should be connected to connected to the climate change policy and carbon neutrality. However, uh, the first version of GSP in, in Green, Green New Deal didn't that mention that much of carbon neutrality, but I think that it, it is kind of integrating now, but uh, in order to be successful GSP, you should have a, a clear connection to the carbon neutrality. And we try to you know, compare the, the document rather than the policy outcome because the green growth has been done and green new deal is ongoing policy. So is that kind of unfair or is it hard to compare the, the two different things? So that's the reason why we try to look at the, the content of the plan. But one of the, uh, the big issue about the uh, green growth was they mentioned that, that they aim to create a job. However, there's no such a, you know, trace and measure and report that how many jobs they actually create, create from that policy. But we see that pretty similar. Uh, we, we do not want to see the pretty similar, you know, outcome, outcome from the Green New Deal. They mentioned that they spend about, you know, huge amount of money and create uh, 660,000 jobs, but you know, if we do not see the clear evidence, you know, GSP uh, policy may not work that much. So uh, how we measure and really boost up the uh, green job is with uh, key, key things. And uh, another thing that I uh, would like to say is that how we uh, boost 
boosting the global cooperation green ODA because the one of the important way to uh, achieve two, two goals, economic goals and the um, environmental cons conservation and climate change response is to, you know, uh, to be achieved by global cooperation and uh, how we uh, secure the budget for global cooperation or green ODA to other country would be uh, one of the uh, key things that we should consider. And uh, you know, one of the, the key criticism on green growth was a uh, construction for a uh, four river pro uh, for a uh, major river project. But you know, we, uh, there's a lot of criticism on that. We spend a huge amount of money, but um, well, we do not see that much of the environmental uh, goods from, from that uh, project. So it's not just construction or infrastructure construction per se, but it's a how we you know, steer this you know, green stimulus policy to uh, real um, green infrastructure build up. That's uh, one of the things that we should consider for uh, now and future. Uh, thank you for listening my uh, pre presentation. I uh, would expect to have a more conversation on my presentation. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Lee. That was so interesting. I was wondering about the difference between green growth and Green New Deal. Uh, our next speaker is Chu Jin Kim. Chu Jin Kim founded Solutions for Our Climate, SFOC in 2016. Solutions for Our Climate is an independent policy research and advocacy group that aims to decarbonize Korea's power sector. Mr. Kim's work as a lawyer has been mainly in the power sector and environmental regulation. He worked for several years on climate issues in the international arena, including serving on the South Korean delegation to the United Nations. Most recently, he partook in government uh, committees related to the development of South Korea's third energy framework plan and 2050 low emission development strategy. Chu Jin received his LLM from Georgetown University Law Center and master's degree and bachelor's degree from Seoul National University. Mr. Kim, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kupan. Uh, it's a great pleasure to speak here to today, um, this morning, um, this evening for those in the U.S. Uh, as introduced, my name is Shujin, and um, I represent an organization named SFOC. Um, we are a climate advocacy group based in South Korea. Uh, whereas Professor Lee has provided his insights on, comparative insights on how the green growth policy in, in the previous administration uh, varies from what happened um, recently. I think what I could contribute today is is to show how the development, how the Green New Deal discussions developed, and what eventually it led to, and what kind of a regional uh, or global climate discussion related um, impacts it had. Um, so I, I, I guess I would be saying talking a little bit more about the realistic part of, of, of the story here. Um, I, I recall that the Green New Deal discussion began. Um, early last year, just right after COVID hit, and just as Korea was moving into election mode, we had a legislative election um, last April um, in twenty in twenty twenty April, and 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 um, during that process, um, uh, after internal discussions inside the governing currently governing party, um, a Green New Deal manifesto uh, was announced. Uh, it's difficult to say what kind of di dynamics and what kind of chemistry applied to that announcement, but uh, the key concepts of, of that Green New Deal manifesto back then was was to uh, was 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 to talk a little bit about carbon neutrality, uh, you know, continue uh, social discussions on carbon neutrality by 2050, uh, and promote uh, market mechanisms such as the RE100. So basically, allowing more private renewable energy producers. Being able to uh, um, supply renewable energy to more supply to more uh, consumers, uh, and prohibiting coal finance uh, of uh, by public institutions. Uh, these still, I mean, the second, first, and third point eventually were achieved, 
um, during the Green New Deal process. And the second point here, which is mainly about reforming our power sector and, and the way it has not been helpful in renewable energy deployment, uh, hasn't yet uh, progressed that much, and it's still an ongoing problem. Um, so what happened after this, uh, after this, after the manifesto was announced in April, um, the governing party, uh, due to its pretty good uh, um, COVID policies, um, did get a landslide win. Uh, they secured more than 60% of seats in the National Assembly in our legislature. And um, that led to discussions on what the New Deal should be. Um, COVID, we were in COVID. There was a lot of confidence for using stimulus back then. Uh, and in that process, at, I believe at the beginning, Green New Deal was not included as one of the new uh, key concepts of the New Deal. But after a lot of internal discussions, um, some criticism, I mean, some expectations, international expectations, especially those coming in from, for example, the United Nations, um, our government announced, uh, uh, eventually announced the Green New Deal in July 2020. Uh, the key point of the Green New Deal here is that it is not much related to climate. Uh, Dr. Lee just mentioned uh, the figures, I mean, 73 trillion won, which is about 60 to $65 billion, depending on exchange rate. And with that money, um, the figure, the the uh, the emissions that will be reduced during that period is going to be about 12 million tons, about 12 million tons uh, by 2025. Uh, wait a second. Sorry about the noise. Um, I mean, twelve million tons by by with with sixty billion dollars is equates to about five thousand dollars per ton. Our current current carbon market carbon prices is about thirty thirty dollars per ton of carbon. So, kind of means that carbon reducing carbon emissions wasn't really the target of the discussion here. Of the Green New Deal here. Um, I mean, nominally, the targets of the Green New Deal was green transition of infrastructure, low carbon and decentralized energy, um, innovation, green industry. But uh, my sense is that my intuitive sense is that it's more of a re repackaging of the already existing policies that already existed in the shelves of our public officials. So with that, a lot of criticism came in from the public. I mean, is it the Green New Deal or Green New Deal? This was one of the stints uh, uh, done by the youth back then. Um, but the discussion with the Green New Deal and, and a lot of, you know, uh, um, public relation efforts uh, uh, relate to that, uh, uh, the focus kind of shifted um, back then. There was a lot of discussions about whether it's right or not for Korea to do um, overseas coal power project financing. Uh, Korea was one of the lead nations, along with Japan and China, uh, providing finance to, to overseas coal fire projects, mainly in Southeast Asia. Um, these are a list of a lot of the projects that happened back then during the past 10 years. And, um, and, and because of abundant financing by Korea, Japan, and China, uh, countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines were had a lot of coal power, new coal power plant projects um, in their future power projects, uh, future power plants, um, uh, which, was, uh, which was really restraining the global carbon budget. Um, so this was a problem. Um, eventually, Coal, eventually, I mean, the happy story is that uh, coal financing became history. Um, this is a summary of how that became history, a little bit longer summary, but um, uh, as I mentioned in 2020, um, there was a national debate over, over pro coal projects in Korea finance, coal projects in Indonesia and Vietnam. Uh, eventually both projects were financed, but after a lot of discussions publicly made, um, the government eventually decided no longer to finance coal projects. Um, um, and I'll, I'll go into these points later on. Um, so this was kind of like what what happened back then. Um, uh, I mean, there were ads like run in, in global global circulation saying that is is President Moon, are you do, really doing a Green New Deal with with the financing overseas coal projects? A lot of um, protests in front of our public institutions. Um, Samsung make the right call on coal. That was a I think an ad on uh, the Financial Times. Um, uh, uh, about criticizing Samsung's investments in a Vietnamese uh, coal power project. What um, also in the political arena in our legislature, there was a lot of questioning about the appropriateness of this kind of financing. Um, these are you know photos of, of the questionings that happened last year, 2020. These are all 2020, not 2021. And eventually what happened is 
after this discussion, KEPCO, our international Korea Electric Power Corporation, our national utility, decided no longer to support um, coal power projects. Samsung also gave up. And Samsung also said that we will no longer do any coal projects in the future. Um, and interestingly, it connected to that discussion, what also happened in the Korean government is that, uh, and, and with, with Japan and China both making a new coal, no, I mean, a, a carbon neutrality commitment, um, around that period, around where the around the time where criticism on overseas coal financing was at its height, um, our government announced to to commit to carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and in addition to that, uh, in addition to that. Um, uh, there was also a very, I mean, with, with clear signals coming, I mean, kind of coming from the government that coal is kind of, and from the public, that coal is kind of dying. Um, there was a, a very strong trend in, in the private financial sector uh, to no longer finance coal projects. So as of now, I think 86, this is a quite outdated figure, close to 100 fin private financial institutions, including insurance companies, banks, asset management companies have, have, have committed to no longer finance new coal projects. Um, so coal in our private finance sector has has clearly becoming no become a no go zone, um, and uh, that has all culminated in in, in 21, 2021 April uh, with with our government's announcement with the president's announcement to, to no longer finance coal power projects at the leader summit on climate summoned by President Biden Joe Biden of, of the U S. Um, the global implication of this announcement was that. Our government, uh, I mean, Japan also made a similar announcement in July at the G20 summit in, 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 in the UK. And then China, the Chinese president, uh, Xi Jinping, also made a similar, similar announcement in, in, in September at the UN General Assembly to no longer finance uh, coal projects. I mean, there is a level of discussion on how specific these commitments are and what kind of projects this will cover. But um, eventually, these were announcements that no more coal. Uh, coal is a negative thing by the heads of states of these big economies. Um, and with this, what happens is that Indonesia, countries like Indonesia and Vietnam had to dramatically drop their coal power portfolios, and their, especially their new coal project uh, pipelines have, have dramatically dropped. And so that was a global kind of effect of, of what, what's happened very domestically in Korea, leading to, to, to abroad. So although the Green New Deal itself, the fiscal policy itself didn't have a lot of um, may not have had all, a lot of uh, uh, greenhouse gas implications. Um, there have been a lot of um, uh, greenhouse gas implications from the subsequent discussions on coal finance taking place afterwards. Um, another, and, and then the, the discussion that took place after that was, was about how we're going to reach carbon neutrality. Sorry about the noise. about carbon neutrality. Um, uh, we are, 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 I mean, and, and, and with that comes in the COP26 Glasgow process where countries were, were required to submit more ambitious NDCs. Um, it was easy for the government to say, we're gonna be at zero by 2050, but where we're gonna be in, in the near term in 2030 was a problem. And um, yeah, and this was this is in, this is brought in a lot of discussions, um, especially this this is related to a lot to how to reform our power sector, what the portfolio of coal power would be in our power sector by 2030, uh, um, and, and and what the role of gas and renewables would be in, in the future. Uh, eventually, what our government decided was to be at 40 percent. I mean, reduce 20 reduce 40 percent of our emissions compared to our 2018 emissions. So it is it is it is quite a, a steep cut. Um, by 2040, but um, there is there there are a lot of discussions about how integrate, how 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 about the integrity of, of this commitment because uh, our government's 40 percent commitment does rely a lot on overseas offsets uh, and and uh, and carbon sinks uh, that that are not considered as the most environmentally in integral uh, um, policies. Um, coal power appears to be the most contentious issue, as I mentioned. Um, and, and, uh, and the atmosphere, social atmosphere of coal power has dramatically changed um, during the past five years. Uh, just five years ago, um, there was not that much discussion on whether coal power is the right thing to do. 
uh, but and, and a lot of coal power plants been commissioned, really increasing the future emission portfolio of the government. Um, but with with com efforts coming up from especially subnational governments, uh, um, coal power has the social license of coal power has dramatically um, changed, and uh, um, and and uh, uh, coal discussions on coal phase that has taken place. Uh, for example, last year, a Ban Ki Moon Lake Commission did announce that coal power should be phased out by 2040 or 2045. And, um, and and this year at COP26, our government, our president officially said 2050. Um, actually, the reality is that our government can provide a, a more ambitious coal phase out date. Um, uh, I would say my hunch is more in the 2030s. Uh, but what's, what's bogging our government's effort down is the fate of our last new coal projects. And this is more a problem of money. How much these new coal projects will have to compensate, be compensated, uh, rather than uh, the appropriate, I mean, it, it is it is very widely acknowledged by our policymakers that coal power does not have a lot of room in, the, in our future. But uh, um, how are we going to compensate the incumbent interest? How are we going to comp compensate the um, already made investments? Is is the current um, difficulty that our government is facing, um, and this is a face. This is an issue that a lot of other countries, for example, Germany, has experienced in its coal phase off discussion. So. This is where we are, um, and I think that's that will be uh, almost all of my 15 minutes. And thank you very much once again. And uh, once again, thank you very much for inviting me today. You're on mute. You're on mute. Unmute. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Kim. That sounds like Korea's two steps forward, three steps backwards, or is it three steps forward, two steps backwards? Um, well, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Hong Jong Ho. He is a professor of economics and former dean of the Graduate School of Environmental Studies at Seoul National University. His teaching and research are focused on environmental and energy economics and sustainable economy and policy. His involvement within the school extends to serving as the former director of the Environmental Planning Institute and the Institute for Sustainable Development. Before his career at SNU, he held academic positions at Korea Development Institute and Hanyang University after receiving his PhD at Cornell University. He also has broad experience working as a consultant for international organizations such as the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, and has previously served as the president of the Korea Environmental Economics Association and Korean Association of Public Finance. Currently, he serves as the president of the Asian Association of Environmental and Resource Economics, chairman of the Energy Transition Forum of Korea, co-chairman of the Korean Federation for Environmental Movement, and policy advisor to the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So, great. Thank you, Mr. Hong, for joining us. Welcome. Hey, thank you, Guan, for your kind introduction. And also, thank you for having me here on this important subject. Uh, I'll try to concentrate on, oh, I'll try to energy transition. Hmm. Guan? Seems yeah. like there's a problem with my Zoom. Um, I think I have to go out and come back again. Okay, I'll do okay. that right away. Okay. Okay. There's, there's some some problem here. Okay. Actually, um, Mr. Hong, it I think it was fine. We could see the we could see it. Maybe he left.
Oh, he logged off and he's going to log on again. Okay. Maybe, why don't we move on to Yu Chang? Kwan, are you yeah. ready to go, Yu Chang? Sure, let me just share my. <laughs> let me uh, introduce you, if you don't mind, tell the people yeah. about you. Okay, sure. so Yu okay. Chang, oh, so, you're here, you're oh, back. Okay, okay. Here. sorry, Yu Chang. We... Um, there was some interruption, I'm sorry. Wait. Okay, um, so is it okay? You can see the slides? Yes, and you okay. know, we could see the slides before as well. Yeah, but there was a sudden message from the Zoom that the, the session will be interrupted abruptly. So, oh, so okay. I don't know why, it's just some, some, some technical problem. But right. it's, okay, so Here we um, are. Okay, I'll concentrate on energy transition uh, following what uh, Mr. Kim Jujin uh, already talked about. Okay, here, uh, let me show you a, a little nice picture. Uh, this is a, a group of mayors and, and provincial governors of Korea. Um, 20, 226 local governments in Korea have joined together to declare a climate emergency and call for a transition to a sustainable society. We have 229 uh, local autonomies, so virtually all the, the, the the heads of these local governments join together, irrespective of, of political party and whether they are conservatives or, or moderates, liberals, progressives, they all gather together and, and said, well, climate emergency is, an, is a critical issue in Korea. Well, but is this enough? That's the question I'm trying to raise. Um, they declared climate emergency, but whether they have strategies, policy measures to actually tackle uh, climate emergency um, is another matter. Okay, here's a little flyer I want to share with you. Well, this is uh, done by the Energy Transition Forum of, of Korea, which I'm representing. Uh, what we did was, it's in Korean, but um, it says wind, and you can see that there's there's a um, wind turbine there. Um, what we tried to do was we recruited college students all over Korea, and um, have a three month in depth um, study um, to to work on their own, have group discussions. What are the problems associated with expanding? on onshore um, wind power in Korea, because our local residents are, their access, acceptance to, to onshore uh, wind power is very low. So what they did after their study, they went to these local residents, the countryside, they stayed there for a week, um, talked to the local residents, farmers, um, how they feel about onshore wind, uh, what, why, why you're not accepting this as an alternative energy source. Um, and they wrote a report um, and we had a, 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 um, a, a conference um, sharing their, their thoughts, their, their findings and some policy measures. So these are some of the things that, that are going on in Korea. Um, the, the governments, local governments, the central government, as the other speakers have talked about, uh, they try to emphasize the importance of, of um, um, 
tackling climate change and, and carbon neutrality. And there are some um, movements among the experts, among the, the, the civil society groups, um, even some businesses are trying to, to, to cooperate and coordinate with, 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 the, the, with the governments and local residents to, to enhance, to expand um, energy transition and expanding the, the um, renewable energy sources. But the problem is it has not been easy. It has not been easy. It's a, it's a struggle all along. So here, this is part of the bylaw of Energy Transition Forum of Korea. And what is a key component of energy transition is understanding the importance of future generation and global environmental risk, enhancing energy efficiency and reducing energy consumption. Thirdly, developing and diffusing renewable energy sources through technological and policy innovation. Um, I would like to share the current status of, of energy market, energy uh, supply and demand of Korea for you to better understand the current status of, of, uh, of Korea in terms of, of where we are at in, in energy transition. Well, energy security, we are the ninth largest energy consumption country in the world. Um, on the other hand, we import virtually everything, every primary energy from outside. Well, we have the highest nuclear power plant density in the world. And we have, on the other hand, lowest renewable energy proportion among OECD, 38 OECD countries. Our PM 2.5 concentration is highest among OECD countries. And in addition to this, our energy price system, our energy market is so distorted. It's, um, there is no country among, at least among OECD countries where they have this type of, of um, electricity market and electricity price system. We are the seventh largest carbon emitter um, in 2019 and just about a month, two ago, our government um, um, announced that we, our NDC will be 40% reduction compared to 2018. Okay, does this all add up? Well, the problem is here, this is a share of renewables in electricity generation. Um, some of the countries, well, the, the country names are in, in Korean, but you can see which country is which, okay? <laughs> because those upper uh, countries, like um, where the share of renewables is more than 70%, um, over 80% even there, Denmark and Austria, okay? Um, Germany and, and UK, they are close to 50%. OECD average is over 30%. Well, unfortunately, Korea is at the bottom, very bottom in green, okay? That's 7.2% renewable proportion in year 2020 last year. Okay, it's, it's, it's at the very bottom. Even um, neighboring countries like, like um, Japan and, and China, their, their share is, is close or just over 20%. So we are well below compared to other countries here. Okay, here's a country by country, some of selected countries power generation mix, okay? Um, there's, there are national flags there that, so you can see which country is which. Um, these are some of the European countries, okay? Um, like France, they have, as we all know, they have um, much nuclear, but they do not have either coal or natural gas, okay? And um, Germany, well, they still have 24% of coal proportion, but they will be, you know, they have um, announced their plan, specific plan to, to decarbonize, the. De um, phase out of, of core power plant. 
in early 2030s by by 2030s okay and um, Denmark we all know that their offshore wind onshore wind is 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 majority of, of um, energy electric supply well here's Korea okay Korea is the only country among OECD where if you add the traditional electricity supply sources, which are nuclear, coal, and natural gas, that consists of 90%, 90%. It's the only country where this traditional source of electric supply is just almost all of the electricities are coming from these three sources still. Japan, on the other hand, after Fukushima, their proportion of nuclear is only 4%. Okay. Well, I have I worked on some study um, how much job creation we can have uh, from energy transition. Okay, this is an extension of my paper, uh, a, a recently published paper. And MTS stands for moderate transition scenario, ATS advanced, VTS visionary. So this is how much we can achieve in terms of, of um, expanding renewables, okay? So VTS, the visionary means a country level renewable energy 100%. If you can achieve 100% you know, renewable energy by 2050, the gross um, job creation by 2050 will be more than 500,000 from only from the, the energy sector and the renewable energy sector, okay? Well, for comparison, I'm trying to share how much uh, current um, employment we have in Korea from domestic car industry like Hyundai or Kia. That's including the direct and indirect employment, 490, all right? So this implies that if you can, um, enhance, I mean, expand renewable energy sources, only within that sector, the energy sector, we can create a lot of jobs in the coming years, okay? Compared to coal or, or, renew, or nuclear, it is a well-known fact that the nuclear sector, I mean, the, the renewable sector can create much, much more jobs compared to traditional energy sources. Okay, why is this not so easy? Why is the struggle has been going on in the, in the recent years? Because I think there is a conflict of values embedded in energy transition, okay? Um, Kuan, we talked about it before you know, um, the session began. The older generation, including my parents, you know, they have endured all this, you know, a prolonged poverty in the 60s, 50s, 60s. And their goal was the modern, economic modernization of Korea. And they all know that fossil fuel and nuclear have been the driving source of energy to have a rapid economic growth in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So they are so much well accustomed to this idea. And it's, it's, is supply oriented with the centralized generation, such as coal and, and, and nuclear. On the other hand, uh, the re renewable sources including wind and um, solar, they are very much different. They are basically distributed generation. It's, um, and we also emphasize in energy transition, the demand management, energy efficiency, you know, uh, reducing energy consumption. This is an idea which is very different from what our older generation have, have, been, have, 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 uh, have been accustomed to have, have experienced. So whenever I talk to my parents, my father even scolded me, your idea is wrong. <laughs> how can solar, how can wind, that type of sources can generate enough electricity to power, <laughs> to continue our economic growth of Korea? That's absurd. <laughs> that's what my, that that's a response from from my father. Okay, um, this is my final slide. Well, there are challenges and opportunities. 
um, in terms of success toward energy transition. I believe as an economist, now Korean people are slowly uh, understanding the, the circular relationship among climate, economy, and employment. Even though it's a slow, I think Korean um, people in general are, are understand, are trying to understand and getting familiarized with, well, there can be some virtuous cycle among climate policy and better economy and more employment. Okay. And as I, I showed you the, the, the picture in the first my first slide, there is there are rapid policy changes in central and local governments. I'm not saying it has been successful. They were strategic enough, but they are moving toward that direction. Okay. And um, there are some companies in Korea where there is innovation occurring in renewable energy technology. On the other hand, there are lots of challenges, okay? Um, for instance, nuclear and coal, it has been 40 to 50 years where these have been the main sources of, of energy supply. So there are industry related stakeholders, including academics in the government, and they are very strong. Their lobbying power is very strong as well. So this has not been easy. And as I said, there is huge distortion in energy market and energy price. Our electricity price is totally controlled by the government, which cannot be sustainable in this world anymore. And we have our um, wholesale and the, the, the retail market of electricity is totally controlled by a monopolist company, which is Capco. And this is, you just cannot find this type of electricity market in any other country among OECD. So um, I think this is the utmost um, policy priority for Korea in the coming years. You have to have a total reform on energy market and energy price. Well, as I said, people in Korea, their social discount rate is rather high because throughout the years, the, the history in the last six years of Korea has been struggle all along. So I'm overcoming poverty and lots of, you know, um, um, social disruptions, political issues. So Korean people in general, they only con concentrate on the, the present. Future is not there. It's, it's, it's something they, they do not have um, um, enough um, pleasant, uh, 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 presence of mind to, to, to consider. But the problem is climate change, climate um, emergency, climate crisis, you know, all these are, 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 are long-term goals uh, with a consistent policy um, needed to be successful. So this has not been easy in Korea because of historical and cultural reasons. Okay, I'll stop there. Sorry for the, the, the interruption, but um, I hope I gave you some insights on what's happening in Korea in terms of um, um, energy transition, struggle, and some success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Hong. It's uh, a lot of similarities to other countries in the world and a lot of unique uh, uh, characteristics in Korea. It's very interesting. Um, our next speaker, I'd like to welcome is Yu Jung Kwan. She is a youth climate activist for Green Environment Youth Korea, also known as Geek. Yu Jung is currently a program assistant for the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. There she advocates for climate justice and a just transition on the basis of intergenerational equity. So welcome Yu Jung. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, let me just share my screen first. Okay. Right, so I first want to uh, thank the previous speakers. Actually, it's an honor to be um, a part of this webinar as well. And um, as a youth climate activist, I kind of really want to share 
my perspective on how youth can really be a part of this um, transition, this energy transition, and how we're advocating for more uh, clean energy, to expand the clean energy in South Korea and outside as well. So let me begin. Uh, just a really brief introduction of who we are. Um, you guys may have uh, heard of our organization or not, but we were established in 2014 and uh, Geek as, um, as so Geek is also known as Green Environment Youth Korea, and this is a youth oriented organization. So we have over around 70 youth um, activists right now who are part of uh, Geek and our main vision as the uh, future generation is to ensure that Worldwide, the global youth are at the forefront of the new climate regime for a just transition and for climate justice. So these just tr transition and climate justice are the key words that are the key driver on why we do what we do. So the key activities that we play out in Geek is we advocate for global cooperation as uh, climate change is a transboundary issue and it's an intergenerational issue. So we really ensure that we're not only advocating at a national level, but we're really kind of uh, ensuring that our voices are heard at the international field as well. And so we attend a conference of uh, youth, we attend the UNFCCC uh, conference of parties, and we also do some other relevant um, cooperation works with the Asian region as well, which I will share briefly in the next slides. And we also do an annual uh, event regarding the power shift Korea. So this is focused on divesting on uh, fossil fuels and really phasing out coal. And we also ensure that our demands are supported by policy. So we are part of the Seoul Policy Network and we advocate under the Climate Environment Division on some relevant policies that will really help ensure that our youth are also considered when we talk about these energy transition. Yeah, okay, moving on. So, um, as I mentioned, the power shift Korea is actually, this started in um, the United States from the 350 organizations. And they made the global power shift movement, which is a worldwide movement focusing to really shift the power access from ensuring that the uh, youth and future generation have a voice in the decision-making process. And also to really ensure that the renewable energy is expanding at a level where we can reach carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, and so in the Asia region as well, this is quite active. Um, and the event itself is really hosted and sponsored by the 350 East Asia. So we, under 350 East Asia, we ensure that annually we really kind of drive this power shift Korea event to our local community as well. Because um, even like, even in the local community, there is not a really shared understanding on the importance of why we have to drive away from uh, fossil fuels and dirty energy and more focus on expanding of renewable energy. So we try to really kind of narrow that um, gap of understanding. And so this is another kind of uh, activity, how relevant to the power shift Korea and how we kind of drive in, drive the divestment movement. Um, on the left side, so this is the street painting that we did in Shintong, which is a very highly populated street in South Korea. And we focus on artivism. So we focus to really kind of um, draw art and make the idea of phasing out coal more simple and more fresh and more lightning to the general public. So they wouldn't be kind of frightened about how heavy the topic is really is. When we talk about energy, it's a very complicated topic, but we really try to level that kind of barrier but make it more fun and more flexible to the general public. And also on the right, this was held in 2017, which was a coal ending bicycle march. And so um, what the people did here was they rode their bicycle from Cheonan to Tangjin. So that's around 50 kilometers. And Tangjin is a city in, uh, in South Korea. And at that time, they were accountable of having the most biggest coal power plant in the world. And this was something that we really want to shed light on to ensure that this was not something to be proud of, but this was something to be ashamed of because uh, regarding the impact of what car coal fire power plants have to the community, to the environment, to our health, we really tried to advocate uh, for this to the public as well. And so you can see our banner at the end, at the very, on the right side, but yeah. Um, so, and the Asia Climate Leadership Camp is also a event that we hold annually with the other Asia youth organizations. And so um, we really focus to kind of synergize our 
uh, momentum in the Asia region because even if you go out into the international community, you don't really see a good exposure of uh, the Asian people. And even uh, going to the UNFCCC, uh, COP26, I really didn't get to hear much of the Asian voices. And I think that it's really, really important that we ensure that we have this kind of uh, momentum of cooperating with each other to kind of to ensure that our voices are heard. And so we hold this ACLC annually and regarding the hosting country, we will be visiting their coal fire power plants and to really understand the severity of the fossil fuel impacts in their local community as well. And then we really bring that um, message back home to really kind of uh, share with our local communities on the impact of the fossil fuels and how in our neighboring countries, what kind of effect it is bringing on in them too. And so that's kind of a annual event that we attend as well. And so because this topic is about Green New Deal, I wanna kind of focus on how we've been uh, like kind of uh, actively focus on the Green New Deal, how we kind of focus on how we should, um, so what our, our perspectives are on the Green New Deal. And so first of all, we did a uh, K Green New Deal video lecture. So um, one of our members from Geek, she came out and she did a lecture on what is the K Green New Deal? What is this whole hype about? Because really when the Green New Deal was released, we consider it a milestone regarding the dialogue on carbon neutrality, climate change, and so we really ensured that our youth and our future generation had a clear understanding of why it was so important and why we needed to be very um, uh, active to ensure that it wasn't a gray new deal, but it was a green new deal. And also, we also focused to kind of publicize what was going on in South Korea by uh, publishing an article and releasing it on the 350.org homepage. So this would attract the wider audience to really engage with the worldwide on showing how South Korea is taking a forefront role on the Green New Deal, but to how to ensure that it is actually green and we're actually focusing to building back better following the COVID-19. And on the very right, this was a press conference that was held uh, two months prior to the actual official release of the Green New Deal held in May. Um, and so we stand, we're standing in front of the president's office right now and we gathered with six other youth organizations in South Korea. And we were advocating that uh, for the government and for a president to ensure that the Green New Deal, when they release it, that it should be, as I continue to mention, as green. And to really ensure that, uh, especially in the energy sector, that we really need to focus on phasing out coal by 2030. And so the press conference, if I translate it directly, is saying that uh, Green New Deal for a climate crisis and 2030 phase out coal. So that was the main message that we were trying to deliver. And so the key demands of Geek regarding for k Green New Deal is, I think this was uh, mentioned uh, pre uh, several times in our, our speech, but um, the first, first of all is the roadmap itself, the Green New Deal, it needs to be aligned to the Paris Agreement to ensure that this is uh, this will help us ensure that we will reach 2050 net zero. And number two was initially back then we were trying to ensure that we would phase out coal by 2030. However, eventually the government announced that they will uh, phase out coal by 2050. Um, and to really focus that our government is making an effort to increase the renewable energy as well. And uh, another main priority is as we're advocating for a just transition as well, we need to ensure that when the government are saying that they're gonna expand more uh, low carbon industries and increase more jobs, they also at the same time need to talk about how they're gonna protect and educate our workers in the carbon intensive industry to ensure that they won't, uh, they won't be fully, so they will be well transitioned into that uh, less carbon industry as well, because all, the, all these years, these workers have been focusing on the carbon intensive industry. So it's really, really important to ensure that the workers are given full support and professional support to really educate uh, on how they can do a just transition from high carbon to low carbon. And the uh, last demand that we were advocating was for to establish climate change environmental mandatory education curriculum, because despite the uh, urgency of this matter, not a lot of students are aware of why climate change is a crisis, why we should be um, really involved in this issue. So really prioritizing this into our education curriculum was another demand that we, uh, we were trying to share.
And so this is uh, some work that was really relevant to, I think you can say that it's Green New Deal, but also really advocating for more clean energy. And this is one of our key activities that we uh, held out since uh, 2020. And the project itself was called People Live Here. So this was a coal power plant that is currently under construction in Indonesia, and they are constructing Chawa 9 and 10. And um, this is a government-led project. And also, so KEPCO, which is a South Korean um, energy, uh, energy industry. So they, them and Hana Bank and other corporations, they are all a part of a team called Team Korea. And they're participating in this project to invest, so uh, to invest in the coal power plant in Indonesia. And so what we were trying to really advocate was saying that this is really going against what the government is trying to advocate for when they're talking about Green New Deal, or when they're talking about clean energy or carbon neutrality. And so we got in contact with the uh, organization in Indonesia as well. And we really kind of communicated with the local uh, residents there. And, and it, we kind of uh, provide like um, some kind of synergy to really ensure that we were proud of what our government was doing and we wanted our leaders to take accountability of the actions. And so, uh, so the photos you see here, they're holding a banner saying that people live here and they're not happy with what is happening right in front of their village. And so this was kind of a product that we advocated as well. And so this is just other photos that really can catch like the visual uh, appearance on what is like, mm, what is really happening behind the uh, shadows. And um, the residents there, they've been really protesting on this as well, saying to quit coal because their village is a heavily, uh, is a village where it really provides good natural resources. And so they will be harvesting coconut and um, fish. And they will go fishing out. And then also they would be harvesting pepper as well. However, due to the impact of coal power plants and how it's uh, emitting so much greenhouse gas emissions that is affecting the air pollution, they can no longer live the conventional way of living. And this is itself, it's immoral as well. And not only that, but they're having severe health issues. Um, and one of the interviewees, she came out saying that her four month year old baby was uh, suffering from pneumonia. And ever since then, the citizens in this city, in this village, have been moving out because it's a place where they can no longer live as they would uh, usually have. And so on the left photo too, it really shows that children live here and they have, they're supposed to have a livelihood here, but because of these coal power plants, which is invested by the neighboring countries, they are affected by health and their livelihood and they just, they this place will no longer be a place where they can live. So it's just really kind of showing what is happening and exposing light and shedding light on um, this village as well. So that was uh, my end priority. And the photos that are captured here is from a document that we also made. And I will share the link on the chat room later on as well. It's a 40 minute, 14 minute video, which really kind of uh, shows why, why we're advocating for this and why it's very immoral and why it goes against climate justice as well. So, yeah. And so I think that when we are saying that, um, I think as a youth, it's very limited on how much we can actually uh, exert pressure on our governments, but we need to really communicate that we are aware of the situation and we're not proud of it. And this needs to stop, even though the governments are doing it not in front of our neighborhood, but they're doing it outside of national borders. And so, what we started is we really campaigned for this by we uh, kind of exposed what was going on through SNS in the media. And we started an SNS uh, campaign challenge where we would tag the main uh, participants, the key players of this project, which was uh, Hana Bank, Kepco, and also the Blue House, the President's House. And a lot of um, different worldwide uh, people kind of supported this challenge and um, yeah, so we were trying to kind of bombay their uh, Instagram DMs to really show that the citizens were very unhappy with what was going on. And another uh, campaign that we also did was, actually this was held uh, during the COP26, um, November 6th. And this was the Global Day of Action 
for climate justice. And this also took place in South Korea as well. And one of our members in Geek, she came out and she kind of really uh, shared what was going on in Indonesia and what Geek was doing regarding this and how as citizens, we should be aware of what our governments were really investing in. And in the meantime, they're also using our tax money to invest in something that we are not willing to support. So that was uh, another kind of action that we made. So um, as before I end my uh, presentation, I really want to kind of uh, share that it's really important that aware action comes with awareness and awareness comes with action as well. So these two come together. And we've really tried to make an effort to kind of share this news worldwide. And I will share all those links that are here, but first, um, in Motion platform, we kind of archived all the relevant articles uh, that are discussing on this problem and are kind of really exposing what is happening. And really reading the news, even though it's not happening inside our country, but outside of our national borders, it's really important to be aware of that because once we're out in the international setting, uh, it, it's we, we are also taking accountability of what our government is doing as well. And it's not something that we can really be proud of. So just to be really uh, aware of what is happening is so important. And also the document that we also made on, um, and it's also uploaded on YouTube and I'll also share the link. It also really kind of reflects what the local residents want. And during the process, not the local, pres uh, the local residents didn't have any kind of say in the decision-making process. And despite for them having all the impact on it from the health, the social, the economic Im uh, impacts on it, they have no say in the progress. So that itself is very injustice and very immoral. So those are the kind of keywords that we really try to kind of extract from that. And the action part as well. So um, we did, we are holding a petition that should be uh, communicated to the our president. However, I also wanted to emphasize that uh, this is only at the beginning stage of the construction. So we still have time to kind of uh, turn the table around. And they're saying that the construction will go until 2025. And according to um, the reports, uh, from 2028, uh, coal will become a stranded asset because solar will become more cheaper than coal in Indonesia. So even after they finish the construction in 2025, they will only have three years of actually seeing the economic benefits of the coal. And then after three years time uh, passes, it will become a stranded asset and because it's more expensive and it won't, it will lose its competitiveness in the market. So this is something that uh, we also were very kind of, we couldn't really understand the whole point of this investment project itself. And so really just taking action on that and putting your voice out regarding how immoral it is, how it's not really economically benefiting anyone and how they're continuously investing on a stranded asset is something that it's important to be aware of and to really put your awareness into action. So yeah, the petition is also available for you guys to uh, participate as well. So yeah, so I would like to end my speech here with a quote that it's kind of, um, it's, it's a quote that really resonates with all our youth and geek. It's that we deserve to do more than just survive, we deserve to thrive. So yeah, thank you. I will end my presentation here. That was superb. Yu Jung, your parents must be very proud of you. Anyway, um, we've got some time for questions about 10 or 15 minutes. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. I do see a question. I did see a question in the chat. And... Uh, I believe it was asking about local input um, on the offshore winds. Does anybody have, let's see. Yes, were the proposals for wind power in Korea along the coast for power generation that was to be run by the citizens themselves? Who will take that? I believe. That was that, uh, Mr. K. 
Kim Yuchin, what's that? Somebody mentioned. No, I think that came from um, uh, Professor Hong's. Um, Professor Hong. Well, I can yeah give my own um, opinion on that. Well, the the usually how it develops is um, onshore wind project first and then offshore because offshore it's more expensive. It's more large scale. Um, but in Korea, because the, the onshore wind projects are much stalled at this moment because of a lot of opposition from um, local residents and everything. So um, the government is, is these days trying to um, improve on, on expanding and implementing offshore wind projects. The problem here is um, just like onshore, the the local residents, the 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 fisher, the fisher industry, the fishermen, uh, they're against this idea because they believe that their uh, fishing productivity will will um, go down because of, of 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 these projects. So it has been slow, and the problem is once um, the a a um, a developer or a company tries to have um, invest in an offshore wind project, it takes so much time um, to actually uh, start constructing the project because of so many regulations and the government, all they do is, is um, ask these these um, project developers and the private companies to negotiate with local residents. You, you come up with um, this document showing that all the local residents agree with this idea, okay? And it takes many, many hours. Um, it takes a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, um, this is just struggle itself. So the project, at this moment is, is, is um, going slow, but um, um, it, it is true still that the government is trying to focus on expanding offshore wind projects uh, because we are a peninsula. Uh, there are much resources in that area. So I hope um, this project can um, catch some momentum and and be uh, on time to to for our our um our climate you know, policies and carbon neutrality um, goal great thank you professor Hong. we have another question here that is questioning a recent article where president moon calls the floating liquid natural gas facility a quote big help to carbon neutrality and it's an article in korea net and there's a picture of president moon on november 15th giving a congratulatory speech at the naming and maiden voyage ceremony for the coral sul floating liquefied natural gas plant, which is headed for Mozambique at Samsung Heavy Industries shipyard. Now, is this, what's going on here? Any comments? I might be able to add a little bit of comments there. Um, yes, I saw that news as well. Um, our president was at the, um, Oh, Mr. Kim, you are dropped out. Maybe if you could turn off your video camera. <sighs> or can you type in the chat or type in the Q&A? In the meantime, do any of the other three panelists have any sort of response to that question? so that we can fill this precious time up. Mm. Okay. I actually have a question and it, oh, did you wanna say something, Professor Hong? No, I, okay. I'm actually not aware of that. Okay. 
I have a question, and that is, um, I can't not think, stop thinking about the um, ambitions of the government of, of the Republic of Korea for many years to expand its military export, its arms export industry, which is the opposite of green. How does the government or how do policymakers reconcile that um, discrepancy and for um, right basically that's it and and um, yeah it, I think I was um sorry sorry Kuan, I would I think I was uh, kind of frozen there yeah you were frozen could you hear us yeah I can hear you now um, I, I had a connection issue but going back to the um, um, oil and gas ship um, yes let's question, talk that, about that was that. it that was a $2.5 billion ship that the Coral Sur was basically a floating um, liquefaction terminal, uh, which you just liquefy just above the well and then put it on, put the liquefied gas on, on the LNG carrier. Uh, and that's that's all possible because there's a lot of public financing going into that. Um, our, our banks, like just like the coal financing fund, our banks, such as Korea Exim Bank or Korea Trade Insurance Corporation, provide a lot of money there. It's It's... Uh, um, our oil and gas financing is about 13 times larger than our coal power financing. So it's a very steep, there's going to be a very steep um, issue. Uh, and But um, but the, the article cites the president as calling this facility a big help to carbon neutrality. <laughs> How does he yeah. square that? Well, that's a, that's a very important discussion. There's, a, there's, a, there's an important discussion taking place right now in Korea about whether, um, LA, not just in Korea, but also in, in, in Europe as well, about whether... Um, uh, gas can be part of the taxonomy, green taxonomy. Gas can be considered as a green thing. Uh, and, and of course, behind there is a strong gas lobby. Um, um, so that's, I mean, this COP26 was, did a really, you know, did a really critical blow to coal, but um, the, the climate discussion ahead will, will be about gas, uh, I believe a lot. And um, we're still at the initial stage, but um, the role Korea plays in the global oil and gas industry is that we're like the global pipeline. Um, we supply, the Korean shipyards supply about 80% of the world's um, LNG carriers and crude oil carriers. So, so I mean, trend, the, the XL, uh, um, Treadstone XL pipeline was a big issue in, in the US and Canada. Um, Korea is like the global pipeline of oil and gas. So, so um, and very dominant in the midstream industry, I mean, which is something that Koreans don't know, actually. I mean, they, they think that they just build, you know, big hunks, hunks of chunks of metal, but um, actually these are critical equipment in, in the oil and gas industry. So that will be a very important topic coming up um, during the next two, three years. So, so um, stay tuned. Yes, this uh, reminds me of what Professor Hong was saying about how industry related stakeholders are so much of an obstacle in actually making that leap to truly green lifestyle economy and culture. So um, that wraps it up. It's an hour and a half past. We've got one minute left. I'll just like to thank all of you so much for um, being presenters today. I think we've learned a lot about the shortcomings and the gains that Korea, the Republic of Korea has made with Green New Deal. Um, as I said before, in December, we will we'll be able to hear about Green New Deal in Russia. And that's December 10th at noon Eastern Standard Time. There's a link in the chat, chat if you would like to uh, register for that. Um, and keep in mind, we prepare reports on all of these presentations, including this one, and we'll, it will be in printed form so we don't lose this precious wisdom and knowledge. So thank you all. And we look forward to seeing you all in our future events. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great to meet Thank you. you.